Just out of curiosity, how many of you know what cats and traps are? I started trying to convince Timmy to come and talk to us tonight, and finally I get him, okay, he's going to talk. So tell me about what you went through. And he starts talking about all of these acronyms, and he gets the cats and traps. Whoa, 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 what is that? And what it is that catapult you off the top of an aircraft carrier. And then you have a hook on the back of the jet, and when you come back in, there's four cables. If you grab one, you're too low. If you grab four, you're too high. Three's the right one to grab, and you've got about an eight inch tolerance to grab it. If you miss them all, I don't even know what that's about. <laughs> but I want to go out on labor, I'm gonna say it's a little bit more complicated than learning how to parallel park with Feeney Davis. <laughs> so, he attended, the highest level school for marine fighter pilot, this naval fighter weapon school where he earned his PhD equivalent title of weapons tactics instructor is also known as Top Gun. <coughs> Please welcome tonight's Alumnus of the Year, class of 1969, Lieutenant Colonel, retired, Dean Grimmie. And uh, tells me what I've got to perform. And then he uh, 
He said, well, have you flown before? I said, yes, sir, I, I have my private pilot's license. He goes, okay. Uh, let me see my helmet bag. So I hand him my helmet bag, and uh, he pulls it out, and he looks at it, and he looks up at me, he goes, what's this? And I go, well, you're famous for throwing your knee board at people. So I thought I'd give you something to aim at. I put a bullseye in the back of my head. <laughs> so we got along great, he's a great guy. <laughs> and 25 hours later of flight time, uh, I'm done. I was first in my class at 25, and I got obviously jet grades, and I got my first choice, uh, which was in Pensacola, Sherman Field, so I don't have to move. So I go to VT4, or VT1, uh, the rubber ducks. Uh, and this is a basic and advanced jet. So the first airplane you fly is the T2 Buckeye. The T34 that I flew for 25 hours weighed about 2,100 pounds and did 180 knots, maybe at its best downhill. This boy weighs 8,000 pounds and goes 500 knots. Faster than any World War II fighter. And we got 25 hours in the airplane and, and they turn us loose. So another picture of the, of the Buckeye. And what they do is you sit, first you go through uh, ground school uh, for the systems on the airplane. Uh, all the, the fuel system, the electric system. Then you're in simulators uh, for emergency uh, action. You have a little checklist, you have an emergency, fire light comes on, you pull it out, you read through it, you do it, and you either land or eject. Uh, and then you learn to fly the airplane. Uh, we're all by ourselves as an instructor chasing us here, but you learn to fly formation. Uh, you learn to land the airplane, you do acrobatics and all the, all the neat stuff. Uh, and then, believe it or not, believe it or not, uh, we'd shoot the, we have 50 caliber machine guns under the wings, and they put us in the gun pack. You haul about a five foot by uh, maybe 20 foot cloth banner, and you paint your bullets a different color, blue, black, yellow, and then we'd go out and shoot at the banner, and then we'd come down, they'd drop it, and then you'd hope that, he, oh my God, I hope I hit it, and oh, there's my color type thing. But proof that you can teach a monkey to do anything, after 90 hours, you go to the boat. Uh, lucky for us, the, the uh, Lexington was a ship that was homeported to Pensacola. So we got to go up on the deck and see all the wires and catapult system. And uh, man, it's a big boat. Okay, now we're in the air. Holy cow, that is a little bit. <laughs> so what you do first is you, um, you have CLPs, field carrier landing practice. You bounce at the field with an LSO, landing signal officer or paddles, that wave you aboard the ship, and they're talking to you. They don't wave paddles anymore. Uh, so this is the Lexington, and kind of a wide view, but the front end, there's two catapults up there, a port starboard, and on other carriers, there are two more catapults on the waist uh, there. Then the island, and the white part is a round down, and the wake, and all that visually is important if the ship's making its own wind, it's a different verbal off the ship than if it's natural wind. Okay, so a little, a little bit closer, uh, and then even a little bit closer. And that's me for my first arrested landing. I had a friend in a helicopter take that picture. So you land, jerks you to a stop, you're real busy, put those couple of flaps of taxi over to the uh, catapult. And the two things I remember on the Lexington was moving, taxiing the airplane, on a ship that's moving was kind of interesting, a different sensation. And the other thing is, like everybody else, I was scared out of my wits, whatever, and get up on the catapult, and uh, the cat officer winds it up to 100% power, and you're supposed to wipe out the controls, make sure they're still working, and you look at your engine instruments, make sure they're working. I can honestly tell you, my engines could have been out on the deck on a, on a pallet, cold, <laughs> and I still would have looked at him, saluted, and shot me off the front. The good news is, they were still working. Uh, went around and you do four, first you do two touch goes, then four, four traps and four cats, and you're done. So then the next airplane is the uh, TA-4J Skyhawk. And this boy weighs about 11,000 pounds, goes about 600 knots, uh, and a very twitchy, very maneuverable airplane. World War II fighters at the end of the war did about a 40 degree per second roll rate. This boy can do 720 degrees per second. It's two in one second. Of course, all of us, when we went up solo for the first time, slam the stick over, bang your head against the canopy, and you went, whoa, I'll never do that again. <laughs> so same thing, go through ground school, go through emergency trainers, about 50 hours of, of trainers. Uh, and then uh, we learned to uh, 
to drop bombs, a little practice bombs, and we got to fight our instructors, ACM, air combat maneuver. And it'd be one v one, one versus one, and then we got to one versus two. Two students against us, we could beat up on them after they'd been beating up on us forever. And this is another picture. The A4 cockpit was so small, you couldn't see below your knees. And when you put the candy down, you have to turn sideways, otherwise it grabbed you or your flight suit. The real reason I got this picture here is that the only picture I could find with a bullseye in the back of my helmet. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, like everything, you go back to the boat. And this is part of FCLP, Field Carrier Landing Practice. And Pat took this picture from the LSO platform. That's not a zoom lens. That's how close the LSO is when, when they're waving you aboard the ship. And that is me. So you go back to the boat. So here, I'm mean, getting ready to get on the start cap, the right hand cap. Uh, on Lex Lexington, uh, and another shot, and you can see you're following this guy. I'm looking at this guy, watching him tell me what to do. So this time it's six traps, uh, six cats, and you're done. And all of a sudden I got my wings. So Pat's putting my wings on me, and I'm damn happy. Uh, then she slaps it to make sure it's stuck, and we're off to Yuma, Arizona. We drive out there in about two days, and I got uh, F fans, F4 fans. So, uh, this boy weighs 30,000 pounds, does 800 knots below 1,000 feet, or Mach 2.4, twice the speed of sound. Um, at the time, I was about 5'11", with my boots pretty close to six feet, so I looked pretty little next to this guy. It's a big airplane, uh, powerful. The, Student is in the front, or the pilot's in the front, and a real radar intercept officer or guy in the back, uh, or back seater, uh, with no flight controls in it. Um, same thing, ground school. It's a real complicated system now. There are three hydraulic systems. There, there's a pneumatic system, and then there's a radar, and in simulators, you have to figure out how to do radar intercepts. Um, and we drop uh, live bombs now, 500,000 pounders. Um, and the first flight, it's a pilot in the back with no controls and a guy that's never flown the airplane before in the front. <laughs> so I remember the first time I threw in the afterburner, uh, you could be kicking the butt. Uh, pretty impressive. And you go out and do everything that's been briefed. And so, somewhere in there, we go up to 20,000 feet, plug in the afterburners, you go about 1.4 miles. So I've gone supersonic. You really can't tell unless you look at the needle. And now unbriefed, he goes, okay, pull, pull it up, put it straight up, go bullseye. Straight up, get it up. And he said, full power to idle. Ooh, this one briefed. Okay, well, the airspeed starts rum, 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 rum. the airplane starts falling backwards. We're about 30,000 feet now. And he ain't saying nothing. So I go, okay, I don't need help. Sit full forward, full afterburner. And after about 10,000 feet, the pointy end finally points down, start flying again. And it's a good lesson. Uh, when you're fighting another airplane, you're either looking behind yourself, or there are all kinds of people talking, uh, and uh, the airplane talks to you physically, it's telling you, but you're not always listening, and it can depart controlled flight. So you need to be able to be ready to handle quick, to recover if you got enough altitude, and fight another day. So that was kind of interesting. Uh, let's see what else we got here. Oh, and because I can never have enough flight time, I weaseled my way into flying co pilot on C-117Ds on the weekend. Uh, old DC-3, it was fun. Uh, hard and hell to land and really hard to taxi, uh, but it was fun. So, done with that, Pat and I raced over to Orange County, California, uh, El Toro, and my first squadron is the Black Knights uh, 314. Um, I was there for 13 months, normal tours about three years. When I got there, almost actually all the pilots except the commanding officer got out. They're all Vietnam vets, and they wanted to get out of the military and fly with the airlines. So it was great for me because they didn't want to fly. It was too hot, it was too late, it was too windy. So I'd be hanging around and I would get all kinds of extra flying. The only thing that's really significant about 314 is uh, in August, uh, one day, hotter than heck, uh, they go, hey, we need to fly over to Yuma to pick up some classified gear and volunteer. And off we go. Go over there, they load this classified gear in an external pod on a pylon. And they said, oh, hey, make sure you uh, get some training on the way back so you do a low level. So low 500 feet, 500 knots, whatever. So we get a chart out, my backseater and I, and we A, B, C, D, F, G, whatever. 
So off we go. At Checkpoint Charlie, I feel something hit the bottom of the airplane. So I roll to see if I can see a dust cloud to see where it hit. I don't see anything. So I fly home, and we can't see it on the airplane, so get out. It ain't there. And they are not happy. So not happy. The next morning at Odar 30, on uh, Friday morning, Chicken Man Widener, my back seater, and I get on a CH 53 Echo or Delta, and we walk up over to Yuma, and then we walk up out to Checkpoint Charlie. Nobody realizes, us especially, nobody knows what Checkpoint Charlie is except us. <coughs> so if something happens, which it did, nobody knew where we were. So we go out to Checkpoint Charlie, and I'm sitting on the jump seat between the two pilots, and we're there's a mountain about uh, 2,000 feet out of the desert, and it's a, a ravine, and I'm pretty sure that's where it's at. And we're right at the top where the ravine is closed down to where the rotors are real close to the dirt. And the plane captain comes me up and hits me in the back as hard as he can, and I turn around, and it's Niagara Falls hydraulic fluid coming out of the main rotor. Chicken Man's already strapped in, he's white as a sheet, and I'm slipping and sliding, I'm sure I'm white as a sheet when I get strapped in. And the pilot does an incredible job and gets us around and he descends down to where uh, he's going down about the same rate as the mountain is until we hit the bottom and we hit like a ton of crap. Nobody was hurt, but it broke the back of the helicopter and this is about 12 o'clock on Friday. So we break out our emergency radios and we um, try to call people. Friday at noon becomes Saturday at noon becomes Sunday at noon, we finally get a KC-130 Air Force tanker on radio, explain where we're at. Yeah, we're out of water, I mean, we're, we're about done. About four o'clock that afternoon, a helicopter come out and gets us, and they're no, we'll get back to El Toro. They're no longer upset that we lost, that I lost the class right here. They're happy we're not dead. So we go home, or I go home, go to the house, and I say, hey, Pat, I'm sorry, I crashed the helicopter. She goes, yeah, I know. I say, well, how do you know? She goes, well, yesterday morning, Captain Hurley, who's a group duty officer in uniform, came over, knocked on the door, opened it and said, yeah, Denny crashed the helicopter and he's dead. And I said, say that again? She told me, and she goes, but don't worry, I didn't believe it. She didn't believe it. So I get on the phone, my blood pressure is about 1,000 PSI or whatever. And I called the CEO and I said, hey, this is what a guy did. He was out of the squadron that day, he was out of the Marine Corps six months later. Nobody knows why he did it. So. That was my tour in 314. Now I go the wrong way. Oh, let me back that up. This is, these are 500 pounders. If you're a low, drop the bomb low level, that's say 500 feet. If it's a low drag a bomb, it'll hit my blow you, blow you out of the air. These are snakes. They're fins that pop out. So it, it, it's high drag, it goes away. So when it hits the ground, you're out of the frag pan which is kind of a neat picture. Uh, and that's me shooting those in Sparrows, 550 pound radar guided missile. Uh, I don't think it hit the target, but I can't remember. <laughs> so now, um, the Navy's short of fighter squadrons uh, for the Coral Sea. So the Marine Corps offers up two, three, 323 and 531. So I go to the Sinks, the Death Rattlers, 323. Uh, January of 1979, and we go, um, we start working with the Air Wing, and now we have to day night call in the, in the Phantom. Uh, it's 10 day traps and six night traps. And believe me, night traps separate the men from the boys. It is very, very hard. Uh, I'd land and I'd be breathing like a steam engine. I could never figure out what I did that. We carried tape recorders and one day I, I clicked it uh, and found it. When I made the ball call saying Phantom 5.1, I <gasps> started breathing like a steam engine. I felt like I got over it, whatever. Uh, <laughs> The, we're supposed to now uh, leave uh, late November of 79, but sometime early November of 79, the Iranians grabbed the American hostages, and that became the hostage crisis. So we scrambled like crazy, we left early November uh, out of San Francisco Bay, and we raced over to uh, Pearl Harbor, uh, and we pulled in the harbor, but we didn't get off the ship. We just was there about eight hours, loaded all the stuff, that we didn't, wasn't ready when we left uh, San Francisco. And then we started racing toward the Philippines. About a third of the way across, we slowed down. It's because everybody in, in uh, Washington said, hey, we need to come up with a plan. So we're going slow for another third. Then all of a sudden, 
uh, we start racing again and we're heading for Korea. So Korea is always hot. And we go up uh, by the DMZ uh, and we do a couple days of missions, whatever. And we pull into port in Busan, which is the very bottom of Korea. And we get off, we've never been in a foreign country really except for Mexico. And pillboxes on every street corner, at least one pillbox is manned uh, by a crew. Uh, and so we're roaming around the town, eating some of the food and uh, drinking some beer. And that evening, the president of South Korea, President Park, was assassinated. Now, I mean, you know what, hit the fan. There's troops everywhere, all machine gun nests are manned, whatever, and they, we get escorted back to the ship and we pull out the port. Stay there a couple more days, cools down. Now we hit the Philippines, do some training, uh, and then we go <coughs> to Singapore, and then we go to uh, the Indian Ocean. This is, uh, we're flying up to the ship. Uh, this is, I'm number three here. Uh, the CO, I'm in the CO's division. The division is a four ship. Section is two, so he has a wingman, and I'm a section leader, and I have a wingman, and it turns out to be a good deal to be in the CO's section or division. This is another picture uh, going up there. Uh, so now, this is a boat. Had left Singapore, we ground India, and we go into the Indian Ocean. We're there for 103 days. We do a uh, eight-day schedule: seven-day flying, one-day maintenance, standing. Uh, and what you're looking at is um, this is the center line, drop lights, the LSO platform's right there, and the ball is right there. When we saw this picture, we were surprised. I, you never see any of this. The only thing you see is that and that, and you're listening to the LSO. Uh, another closer picture. It's an RF-8 photo reconnaissance aircraft photo reconnaissance aircraft that took the picture. And you can see he's a little high, so he's probably gonna grab a four wire, uh, but he's not gonna land because he's way left to center. If you hit 12 feet off the center line of the uh, center line, they have to pull the cable because it's overstressed the engine that absorbs all that impact. And the reason you don't see anything is because when the LSO says, call the ball, you say phantom ball, they know what kind of aircraft, and you'd say how much gas you got for 5.1, 5,100 pounds. And the arresting crew gang now set the tension on those engines. Um, if you hit it 12 feet off center line, they have to pull a cable to inspect the engine that was overstressed. More than a dozen times at night, we'd launch 20 airplanes plus with one wire. And we operated blue water ops. There ain't no place to land but on that boat. Iran's north of us, Somalia's to the west, and, and the Indian Ocean's all around us. So you either land there or you eject. That's it. And I think there might be one more shot. Okay, that was that was the blood end. Okay, now the pointy end. And the Phantom, if this had been a normally loaded aircraft for mission, they would have ejected. But he's a, a CQ carrier qualification weight, so he's lightweight, almost one to one thrust to weight ratio. In the Phantom, you take your throttle and you lock your elbow and pull out your burner. And you take the stick all the way back and one wrist out. And then they punch off the front end. You took all the shots on your attitude indicator and there's letters pretty big. The first third of the stroke, those letters would blur. As, of, as you accelerated, you could finally get it to focus again. So you kind of, screw, not screw it, but it, it's different. And then when you come off, you're trying to catch it because the airplane can over, over pitch like that, over rotate. If it had been a fully loaded airplane, he's stalled. He, there's no flying speed. So he sticks full forward right now, but he's got to be able to catch it. When it comes down, he's got to pull back to keep him going in. If he's fully loaded, it goes down and you see two ejection and a splash in most of these pictures. Uh, luckily, he was a, a, a CQ weight, so he survived. Uh, so the point in was pretty dangerous too but basically you're along for the ride. Now, we're in the Indian Ocean. Uh, there's uh, Gonzo, uh, where's Gonzo? Uh, somewhere, Gonzo Station and Kermit Station were the stations. This is Iran, this is Somalia, this is the Straits of Hormuz, and this is the Persian Gulf here. And these are bullseyes, Alpha, Bravo, Charlie. 
these are caps, combat air patrols, and we'd be here at Gonzo Station, and we'd fly. This is about 35 miles off, and this is a chart I carried with me. So if there's a target to go after, they would say, uh, Bullseye Bravo, 180, 60 miles. And you go, okay, there's a, there's where he's at. And there's calculations, the plotting you do in your brain, and uh, you go to intercept it. We weren't supposed to go inside this line, but we'd actually go right here. There was nothing growing there. I mean, it's just the most desolate place on the planet. So April 23rd, um, we see a Marine CH-53 Delta uh, approach the ship, and then wave off, and we're like, mm, he ain't supposed to be out here. And we're always talking about you know different plans, but we're not clued into what's going on. <coughs> the next day was a stand down, and uh, we briefed all day on what the mission was. And our mission was a fighter pilot's dream. We're going to sit over Bond and Boss, and if they take them off, shoot them down, period. Rules of engagement in Vietnam were incredibly complex. My backseater was an Air Force major in a Marine squadron on a Navy boat who had spent time over North Vietnam in a backseat of a family. And he turned around to me and looked at me and said, I cannot believe they're going to let a first lieutenant start the war. And I laughed and said, watch me. <laughs> so, all night we're uh, and he just said, you know, briefing what we're going to do. And I'm in the skipper's division, so we're going to be the first guys over there. So we got the best chance. So bottom line is, 6 o'clock in the morning, General Quarters, General Quarters, man, your battle stations. Uh, home. They know they're up there. We run down, get our gear on, and we sit and we wait. And we wait, and it comes about 9 o'clock. Finally, they manned the five-minute alert. Has a phantom on the cap, uh, ready to go in less than five minutes. Okay, the skipper gets in, an hour later, he gets out, his wingman Max gets in, an hour later, me and my backseater get in. 10 minutes later, the captain of the ship comes up on the 1MC, the loudspeaker, and he says, tell the whole ship, nobody knew what's going on. So he tells everybody what's going on, there was a rescue attempt. Unfortunately, two airplanes crashed, a number of servicemen died. Uh, so, mass depression. Five minutes later, launched the alert pod. Most guys sat in the airplane, you got five minutes to take off. I always strapped in. You strapped in above your ankle, above your knee, at your hips and your shoulders. All I had to do was put my helmet on, close canopy, and away we go. The other guy on the number one cab was thinking of home and mother, and boom, I'm off. Normally when you take off a carrier, if you're on the right side, you do a right clearing turn. On the left, you do a left clearing turn. So if something happens, the ship doesn't run over you. And then you go out about three miles, uh, 200 feet, and then do your business. I go off the front end, and I make an immediate right turn, cross the bow, and start climbing, because that's where Bondra Boss is. And we climb up, we switch to a controller, and we go up somewhere around here, and the bottom line is either some, nobody's ever born or whatever, so we set up a cap, and we sit here for a couple hours, uh, and come back and arrest. Yeah, but it's not over. There's all these small boys, up in the Gulf, destroyers and other crap that they're afraid they're gonna screw with and come through the straits. So, till about two in the morning, we were capping right over Bonder Boss to make sure they didn't take off and, and do something to those ships. So, rescue attempts a failure, people died, and we're heading home. So now, let's see this oh, we'll go ahead and do that. Okay, so, we're coming home. We left about three weeks early, we're coming more than three weeks late and all the wives and girlfriends and children are waiting to see their loved ones. So they come to the hangar and it's the hangar deck or the, the ramp is a restricted area. And so there's a white strip in front of the hangar, about three feet the whole length. And they tell all the wives and girlfriends, hey, this restricted area, you cannot cross this line. Do not cross this line. When your husbands or boyfriends, whatever, cross the line, be reunited. So we all land at once and uh, Either Pat didn't listen or nobody told her. Because uh, the bottom line is, we took one step past the tail of our aircraft, and it was like Secretary at Churchill Downs. And the flag is up, and she was off and running. And all the other wives said, well, if she could do that, so, but she's leading the charge big time. And two photographers, one from the LA Times and one from the uh, Orange County Register, took this picture. And that's pretty close to point of impact. <laughs> and that was on the front page of the LA Times and the Orange County Register for two days in a row. So that was kind of cool. So now we're back uh, on land 
and I've been selected to be the next pilot training officer. So the Marine Corps had a program that nobody else had, uh, and it was uh, uh, air combat training instructors. Mod squad, a separate squadron with instructors would come, and you, they're teaching you to precisely brief a maneuver, to fly it, and precisely debrief the good and bad of what you did. And when you're pulling G's in an airplane, if you pull five G's and you weigh 200 pounds, you now weigh 1,000 pounds. Well, blood's out of your brain, and it affects your me immediate memory. So you teach, you teach yourself to write while you're flying, to try to remember what went on, and we also had tape recorders. So it was about a four-week course. It was brutal, learning all the energy maneuverability of airplanes, all the missile parameters, all that, and all the maneuvers, and then precisely flying them the best you could, whatever. Um, then a couple of weeks after, or couple, in October of, of 80, uh, I go to Naval Fighter Weapons School, Top Gun. Uh, it's about a six week class. And I'm sorry, back to ACTI is like a bachelor degree uh, as a fighter pilot. Top Gun is sort of like a master's. Uh, it now teaches dissimilar combat, not fighting another F 4, but uh, fighting MiGs, fighting F 14, 15s, whatever. Um, We'd brief in the morning, or we'd have lectures in the morning, and then we'd fly in the afternoon, uh, and it'd be one versus one, uh, one v one, or be one v many, uh, against all kinds of different aircraft. And it was really a, a fun school. After we flew, my backseater and I would go down to the secret library, and we would read. We didn't need to read about aircraft or missile systems. We wanted to read about the pilots we might fight. So we wanted to know what their education background was, what their uh, life was like, uh, did they really want to do it, did, do they have a dying passion like me to be a fighter pilot, or they just did it because of the better way of life. And that kind of came in handy later. Um, real quick, I've never seen the movies on Top Gun, but a little history. In Korea, the kill ratio was uh, 10 to 1. 10 men shot down for every F-86 shot down. Vietnam, 1964 to 1967. Air Force kill ratio, 2.7 to 1. Navy, 2.7 to 1. Well, in 1967, late to early 68, they started to bomb Alt. And the Navy said, we got to do something about this. So they got this Captain Alt, and they came out with the Alt report. Uh, and he basically said, hey, when they invented missiles, sidewinders and heat sinking and radar guided missiles, that they don't teach dogfighting anymore. In the Air Force, it was revoked. You could not dogfight Phantoms. In the Navy, you could, but it wasn't a taught, structured thing to learn. And the guys that had figured it out wouldn't share it because they wouldn't be top talking the squadron. So Alt said, hey, we need to do something about it. And it said, form a thing like Top Gun. First class in 1969. The bomb and halt went to 1972. So for three years, Top Gun graduates went out and taught all the guys in the squadrons how to dogfight a Phantom. May of 72, air war starts again. Air Force at the end of the war, kill ratio, 2.7 to 1. Navy, 12 to 1. There was not one engagement the Navy had with MiGs and they didn't kill at least one. So Top Gun are instructors that instruct people that haven't gone there. Okay. Marine Corps has one more thing. Uh, it's called WTI, Weapons Tactical Instructor. And it actually was the new school I went to. It's about six weeks over in Yuma, Arizona. And it's the entire Marine Corps. It's A4s, a F4s, uh, A6s, all the helo boats, and the grunts. Uh, tanks, artillery, uh, battalions, whatever, of, uh, of grunts on the ground. And it's had some lectures, but basically you get an ATO, air tasking order, when you go to war. And it, this comes down from higher up, and you have to execute that ATO. And we, during this schooling, we'd have, okay, you're the commander and you do your mission. And everybody learns how to work this system. Uh, and it was neat. Almost 10 years to the month after I graduated from WTI, Desert Storm went on. And the guys that ran Desert Storm were the WTI graduates that knew how to run a war. So pretty damn cool. Uh, and it was a neat school. Okay. So I'm back at 323. And uh, we're going to, uh, in late uh, 82, 
uh, a list of 40 pilots come out who's going to be the next, uh, for the first F-18 pilots, and I'm on the list. And since I'm in 323, the second squadron to convert, I stay in 323, and I convert uh, and finish in early, early 83, still a pilot training officer. Now, the coral sea is going to go out again with Hornets on board with 323 and 314, and they're going to go to the Med, and I want to go in the worst way, because Libya is heating up. So they go, no, sorry, you've been here too long. You gotta, you gotta move, and I whine like a cut dog. I didn't get to go. Uh, if you think about this class, there's 16 pilots there. When I retired, there was only one plant guy on the planet had more F-18 time than me. And the, there's two other guys who were number two and number three uh, for flight time. So high time flight guys out of that squadron and three other guys uh, made general. So a pretty neat uh, group of guys. No competition. Uh, so I went up to 125 uh, in late Navy Lamore. I'm um, there for three years. In the three years I was there, I deployed 10 10 day debts to Fallon each year, that's 300 days. And I deployed three 30 day debts to Yuma, Arizona, when it was too foggy to fly in the valley. That's 330 days. Then for the last year and a half, I flew seven days a week because the reserve squadrons who went flying on the weekends are airline pilots. Uh, I volunteered to train them, so I'm flying seven days a week, and I'm loving it. And toward the end of that, uh, 314's operations officer, Nick Sutherland, flies along and kills himself. And I immediately call headquarters Marine Corps, and so I want to replace him. And they go, you ain't called in the Hornet, click, day and night on the ship. So I run down to the skipper's office, I hate skipper. Next time we send our students out the boat, can you give me a, an airplane and a, uh, a deck time to get called? He goes, hey, I'm sorry, we can barely get our students done. Roger that. Run down to the CEO of the reserve squadron. Hey, Skipper, what's the chance of giving an airplane deck time to get a day night call? No problem. So out I go, uh, get a day night called, and I come back and I land about four in the morning. And I call Washington, D.C., and I say, hey, I'm day night call in the morning, my bags are packed. They go, unpack your bags, you ain't going. We sent somebody else. So of course I boo hooed about that. <laughs> So my next tour was back to the Snakes as the operations officer. Uh, during these three years, only did a couple things unique. One, uh, went to Yukon, Japan, for like the second squadron to deploy there in Hornets. Flew in the Philippines, was really fun. Uh, and that's a six month deployment. And then we went to Egypt and did a thing called Bright Star. We lived in tents in the desert and we were there for about six weeks. And the, the exercise, was to fight to train, but to fight the Egyptian Air Force. These are the guys that fought the Israelis in 73 and before, uh, and it came back to the secret room uh, at Top Gun. If they had ever taken off the first day, we'd have killed every one of them. We would have slaughtered them. They were absolutely, impossibly incompetent as fighter pilots, which I already knew from reading, but it, it just proved it. But it was fun flying over Egypt, I can tell you that. There were no rules. So, uh, let's see. In Egypt, or I'm sorry, in, in Iwakuni, that's Mount Fuji. Of course, I'm always number three uh, in Hornets. Um, and coming back from this tour, there was a squadron called VX-4. Uh, and it's a, a test and evaluation squadron. Anything new that goes on a fighter airplane, whether it's a bullet, a missile, software, uh, nurse map system, it doesn't matter. The, evaluators take it, test it, write up reports, and our, basically our job is to break it. It's like we're in the fleet and we're gonna abuse the crap out of it. And if we break it, we'll tell the manufacturers how to, how to fix it or they'll figure out how to fix it. Uh, very, very fun. The other neat thing about it was when you're in a squadron, you only fly the airplane you're called on. Well, VX-4 had F-4s, F-18s, and F-14s. I already flew in the F-4, one simulator, I was back in that boy. And then I went to a uh, <coughs> school and fly the F-14, which is a fun airplane, but it's humongous. The F-4 weighed 30,000 pounds empty. The Tomcat weighed 45,000 pounds empty. I mean, it was a humongous airplane. Of itself, it very fast. And, and, and a good airplane, I suppose. I'd rather have the horn. Toward the end of this tour, uh, Desert Shield starts. Of course, I immediately call everybody I know. Hey, I'll be the coffee best on the sweet floors. Let me come. And they go, sorry, you got a job. So we started a seven day work week with Desert Shield. All the Marines go to Bahrain and we're trying to fix all the little problems that they said, we don't really need to fix these things that we'd identified pre previously. 
but now we're going to war, so we need to fix it. So we're scrambling trying to get that done, and I'm still whining about not being there. And then one, now Desert Storm has started, now I'm really whining, and I'm with the skipper, a guy that I didn't like, and uh, finally he said, hey look, this is on a Saturday, unless your name comes across on a message with your name requesting your services, you ain't going. And internally I laughed, because he didn't understand how Marine fighter squadrons work compared to Navy. Navy's are locked on boats, Marines aren't. So I scurried down to my office, I called my buds in Bahrain, Sunday morning, I walk and I put a message on his desk and it said, Major Grinding, we need his services, blah, blah, blah. And to his word, he went to the Admiral, the Admiral said, okay, you can go. And I blast off to uh, Bahrain. I get there eight days before the end of the war, because nobody knows that then. Uh, and I flew seven missions in eight days. Um, the second to last mission was, um, this thing quit? It's dead. I'll talk loud. <laughs> Okay. So, is it working? No. Okay. The uh, so the second to last mission I flew, it's night mission. I haven't tanked off an aerial tanker in two and a half years. It's crappy night. It's bumpy, and I got a load of bombs on. But we tank. And we, we just go across uh, the coastline, and we see, think of 465, all lanes. It's as far as you can see, a river of white lights, and then turns to red tail lights. And everybody's leaving Dodge. They're trying to get out of Dodge before the end of the war. So we, we take, we're each carrying four pound <coughs> bombs. So we pick a point, and we cork them on that end, and we cork them a couple, three miles, four miles down the road and we turn out the lights, and then we do it again and again, and then we're Winchester on our, on our uh, bombs, meaning you got no more. Uh, we have a 20 millimeter uh, Vulcan, which is shoot 100, 120 millimeter shells a second. I flip mine to 66, second, 66 a second, 4,000 a minute, because I wanted to have, I didn't want to melt a hole in the ground, I wanted to do as much damage as I could. They could see us, when, they couldn't see us when we were dropping bombs, but they could see the nose light up when the cannon lit up and they would turn their lights out, because they'd see that. And just before bullet impact, I swear to God, they turned the light back on, and then we'd permanently turn out the lights. And this is what you really pay us to do. Well, I did it with uh, Red Devils, 232. You cannot count the number of vehicles in that picture. And we did miles of that. So, uh, next mission was the last mission. Uh, my last bomb, I went dud because I couldn't find the target until it was too low and I, I didn't, didn't have time to arm the bomb. So the next day the war's over, I go home and, oops, 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 oops. and I'm back to, to uh, VX4. VX4 from the 1965 or 64 did a test and had a black phantom. And uh, Playboy, uh, Hugh Hefner had a DC-9 up at Purdue, a black DC-9 with a Playboy bunny on the tail. And the squire calls, hey, Peter, can we put the bunny on our tail? He goes, sure. So wrote a letter, yeah, it's okay. Davy accepted it. And then uh, this is pretty close to the last flight of a phantom in the Navy squadron. Uh, they decided to paint the Tomcat black. So that's a, a different skipper I like and me. Uh, and that was pretty close to the end of, of my tour at VX4. Went back to El Toro, uh, did another tour, uh, Iwo Kuni. Ended up as a wing operations officer. Had my last flight on 7 December uh, with uh, 212, uh, the Lancers. And on Friday, December 8th, I got in my car, drove out the gate. I had a great career. I still had a pulse. Thank you. <laughs>